This story has it all. Extras from Hogan's heroes pretending seemingly to be in charge of firefighting services, a news crew from The Simpsons complete with a decent facsimile of Troy McClure, a neighbour from Fright Night with half his face blown off, and a two-for-one lithium-ion battery hazmat fire in one of the world's preeminent living cemeteries. I'm Julian Logan from AutoExpert.com.au New cars cheap, Australia only, website, card. This weekend just gone, the Metropolitan Fire Service attended a spiritually fulfilling and also doubtless emotionally charged uplifting garage fire in the middle of the night at Seaford Meadows. E-bikes, plural, were energetically ablaze, but hey, everyone got out safe with only moments to spare, so... Yay. I'll put a link to the full atrocious 7 News report somewhere up there. You can check it out for yourself. I suggest you do because in my estimation it is emblematic of everything that is so fucked up about TV news and also modern public policy, personal opinion. They are so consistent. It is frankly amazing when you think about it. Seaford Meadows is, of course, the gateway to Sexyland Morfitt Vale in South Australia. It's one of the best damn sexy lands in the entire country. In one of Australia's two World Heritage listed living cemeteries, Adelaide. Seaford Meadows is nestled just 10 k's or so from Sexyland Morfitt Vale. It's even closer as the crow flies. You can smell it if the wind is blowing just right. But by road, of course, you have to negotiate your way around the breathtakingly beautiful Onkaparinga Mosquito Swamp, which is a real highlight of the area also. Like, hey, dude, it's not sexy land, but it is pretty good. Australia's other heritage-listed living cemetery is, of course, Canberra. Arguably a bigger and far more fake shithole, philosophically at least, but this is of course mitigated in Canberra's favour, without a doubt, by the memorial to the death of integrity, which is well worth a visit if you're over that way. It might take a few days to get the stench off, however. Just burn your clothes and scrub hard, dude. Don't get me wrong, the rest of the world also offers some excellent living cemeteries. Detroit, Auckland, Bratislava, Helsinki, Macau, Dubai, Birmingham, and of course, Frankfurt. The cities that fun forgot. All delightful living cemeteries in their own way. But it's just national pride talking, I think, when I say Adelaide is the best damn living dead place I have ever visited. Oi, oi, oi. So anyway... A neighbour pounds on the door in the middle of the night. Your garage is on fire, dude, kind of thing. The Metropolitan Fire Service rolls up in due course. Everyone gets out safely, albeit by a frickin' bee's endophallus. But sometimes that's all it takes, right? The fireys drag a substantial pile of char-grilled e-bikes out into the street. Seven in total, if memory serves. Apparently, the residents of the premises have something of a collection. Fast forward several hours. The blackened e-bikes piled up out the front enter thermal runaway for hazmat hilarity round two. Greg, the Fright Night neighbour, appears to have paid something of a price for his enduring commitment to neighbourhood watch. He describes the second event as being, quote, like a bomb going off, unquote. I do hope his face grows back. He seems like a nice chap. Now, there's clearly a fine line, right, between bravery and foolhardiness. That is somewhat documented. But I would argue Troy McClure here from Seven is kind of crossing it. Jeez. Imagine intentionally standing downwind of a fire that is almost guaranteed to be off-gassing hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, cobalt compounds and other heavy metals, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur dioxide. Like, what's second prize? What did you do today, honey?
What is Seven's official OHS policy on this kind of thing? Nobody knows, not even them. The tie and the hair are perfect, however. That is how you dress dignified for TV. How did the news get there before the fire service? Like, they filmed the arrival of the fire brigade. Bunch of hand grenades going off just out the front. Like, nobody in that situation calls the news first, do they? Earlier, the fire service actually left the return of the living dead e-bikes piled up in the direct fucking sun. Which, just for complete disambiguation, you should never do with batteries. Especially the damaged ones, just saying. Keeping them cool, such a good idea. After some predictable fire-type theatrics, the second fire goes out again, and Seven's Troy McClure interviews this guy, who's Andrew French, an investigator with the fire service. Now, up front, I get that being interviewed is not his job. And I get that it's never pleasant being bounced by a freaking news crew, having done it once or twice. I further get that they can interview you for like 10 minutes or something, in which time you can say rather a lot, and most of what you say will not get a run in the bulletin. And I get that you don't have any control over what gets a run and what doesn't. News is generally not a collaborative process, right? It's run by a brain-dead dictatorship which serves only its own agenda. This is news generally, right? Not specifically Seven. They're only typically shit at this. There's nothing extraordinary about them whatsoever. But here's what did get a run from Mr. French. Quote, Don't put them together yourself. Mr. French is talking about DIY assembly of e-bike battery packs. He goes on and says, quote, get an e-bike from a professional in a store. For fuck's sake, dude. How is this useful community safety advice? Like, show me, because I'm not getting it. Now, he might have said a bunch of dead set useful stuff and Seven might just have chosen not to run it in the bulletin and if that is the case, that would be on them. I just personally don't know anyone on the brink of putting together their own e-bike battery pack. Do you? Pretty clearly this is not anything that I would define as being close to the front line of the battle to make these friggin' devices safer in society, therefore. Not leaving anything on the charger while you sleep, where possible, might be a nice idea, don't you think? However, it's pretty clear to me, at least I formed the view from the plain evidence in sight in that news story, that the Adelaide Metropolitan Fire Service has kind of failed spectacularly to adapt to the growing presence of lithium ion batteries in the living cemeteries, gateway to sexy land by the mosquito swamp precinct and other nearby locations, presumably. I don't think they're any more or less shit than other fire services across the nation, like relatively speaking, but they are fairly shit at this in absolute terms. That's just a personal opinion. Here's the evidence, right? They already put this fire out once. Everyone, but especially a firefighter, knows, or they fucking well should know, that damaged battery packs, including those that have been previously on fire, are preposterously likely to reignite, like to re-enter the state of thermal runaway. Dragging them out into a pile just out on the street in the sun is probably not a sound approach, therefore, to mopping things up professionally. There's ample evidence for this. Damaged battery equipment really needs to go into a sizable container full of water or brine or sodium carbonate to absorb future thermal runaway energy and also, in the case of the electrolytes, to discharge any remaining viable cells in the battery. 
letting it burn out. Well, I suppose that's an option, but a poor one, I'd suggest, unless you really want a cloud of toxic hazmat shit blowing all over the freaking suburb, poisoning, I don't know, the World Heritage listed mosquitoes, or whatever, or heaven forbid the people. And incidentally, I'm not blaming the firefighters who attended season two of Hazmat Hilarity in Seaford Meadows, but from a community perspective, the MFS failed. The service failed the community. The only thing more fun than raining cobalt compounds and acid all over a suburb is doing it twice. This is obviously a high-level policy and procedure failure. Like, the working stiffs at the coalface of fighting fires are clearly not equipped, nor apparently trained adequately for this. And that's your tax dollars not at work if you live in the cemetery, right? These fires are going to be a salient, increasing feature of society into the future. Just this morning, I got a press release, okay? It says e-bike sales forecasted to surpass conventional bike sales in Germany. Apparently, 7.36 billion euros are being spent on e-bikes currently. And those corrupt shitheads at PwC did research on this and predicted that car sales could drop by as much as 25% as more Germans get about the place on two wheels using pedal power with battery assistance. The same trend will take place in living cemeteries everywhere, no doubt, in time. Now, most e-bikes have batteries in the range of 350 to 800 watt hours or something like that. So if we said seven e-bikes in this conflagration, like the progenitors of these two sexy land gateway streetscape bonfires, totaled about five kilowatt hours of destructive potential, that would be in the ballpark. But if you've got a big lardy ass TV or something in your garage, it'll probably have a 75 kilowatt hour battery, maybe even more, which is something like 15 times bigger problem wise if it defecates in its trousers while you are blissfully ensconced between the sheets, perhaps with the boss's freaking secretary. And I guarantee the fire service hasn't got a tank or exclusion zone provisions or transportation procedures or hardware in place to deal with all of that, mainly because senior executive bureaucrat assholes and politicians are all telling us she's all good, mate, like totally safe. I guarantee there are numerous ministers for people who cannot locate their buttocks with both hands in a mirror at state and federal levels, it's a big department across the nation, who are hell-bent on not hearing any narrative to the contrary on batteries because we are on the road to electric utopia. Net zero, shit, yeah. And heresy of this nature, right, it's not going to be tolerated. At the same time, these shitheads would doubtless be denying requests for further training of firefighters and any and all requests for battery-specific firefighting equipment upgrades. Like, look how well ScoMo's mob did with the bushfires just a couple of years ago. He fucked off to Hawaii and he wouldn't even meet the experts at any time before the fires. And let's not forget... This current mob are less shit, but only slightly so. Like, dude, you want to spend how much on an appliance with a glorified swimming pool on the back to transport burned e-bikes, scooters, lawnmowers and sundry battery devices safely for disposal? Plus an even bigger one for cars. How many of each of these was that in your proposal? Don't you already have hoses? We could get you some bigger hoses. And we might do a subtle rebrand of the service. How would you feel about that? <laughs> to a washed up lawyer asshole, i.e. a politician, all of reality is just amenable to negotiation or debate. And of course, in politics in particular, nobody wants to be accused of behaving like an adult and actually dealing with inconvenient situations. All up, this is a somewhat inconvenient situation, I would argue. Like, fire number one here 
well done. Saved the day. Albeit with a bit of a disqualification on the mop-up. Fire number two was absolutely foreseeable and preventable, like easily preventable. Just add water, literally. And it happening is therefore an epic cock-up for which someone in authority is responsible, surely, and should be held accountable. I won't be breath-holding on waiting for that, though. Mainly they should be accountable because a 15 times bigger replay of this shitty situation is just one defective EV in a garage away, isn't it? And I don't want to live in a world where I'm, you know, cut off from Sexyland Morphet Vale because of a mismanaged hazmat event. Nobody does. Of course, Troy McClure from Seven would be A, unaware of the complex nature of this issue and therefore kind of unable to ask salient questions to this effect, but his hair and his tie are very nice indeed. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if his tie was made from his hair. That would be quite bespoke when you think about it. Reporters do get a generous clothing allowance, but hey, what's to stop you weaving your own hair into a tie one day and making that a thing. It's very sustainable. And B, I think we're up to, he's probably not that motivated to ask senior fire service personnel or the minister for unlocatable buttocks how they could have botched mopping up this first fire so badly as to lay the foundations and erect fire number two just hours later in exactly the same place, thereby placing the community, the mosquito swamp, and even sexy land Morford Vale at severe additional risk. This is the world in which we currently live, or in Adelaide's case, the cemetery. <laughs>